Good evening. Welcome tonight. We're going to begin with a wonderful promise from Scripture. If you abide in me and my words abide in you from our Lord Jesus Christ's uh, wonderful teaching in Acts 15. Uh, pardon me, John 15, talking about the abiding life. So this next song, hymn 390, directs us to that wonderful truth, abide in Christ, abide in me. Let's stand together as we sing, constantly abiding. a peace in my heart that the world never gave, a peace it cannot take away. Though the trials of life may surround like a cloud, I have a peace that has come there to stay. Constantly abide is mine, constantly abiding, rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely, whispers also kind. I will never leave thee, Jesus is mine. All the world seems sing of a Savior and King when peace sweetly came my heart. Troubles all fled away and my night turned to day. Blessed Jesus, how glorious Thou art. Constantly abiding Jesus is my Welcome this evening. We're so glad you're joining us for this evening's service as we uh, continue to look through the material on uh, freedom from addiction. Pray that this will be a blessing to you and perhaps even not may in your life just alone, but also that you'll be able to use it uh, to help others. Just a few announcements this evening. I want to remind you that tomorrow we are taking our juniors up to Camp Grace. So if you would please be praying for them during this week. Uh, I know last year uh, when the juniors came back, one of the things Camp Grace does is when there's a decision made, they write that out and they send it back to the pastor. And it was neat. It was very exciting to see some of the decisions that some of the young people made last year. And so please be praying for them uh, that they would be drawn closer to the Lord during their time at camp. Reminder, next week is uh, Happy Father is a Father's Day. So Happy Father's Day early. But a uh, reminder that we will not have an evening service. So we will just have the morning service and then the afternoon and evening spend uh, with your family. Reminder also that we have an upcoming bridal shower for Taylor Worley. The uh, date and time are not there, but they are in the bulletin. It is June 25th at 10.30. So June 25th at 10.30, and will be held here at the church. And then in two weeks, we are starting our VBS. So please be praying for that. 
there are sign-up sheets in the lobby as well as you can sign up online if you wish to uh, volunteer or if you have young people that you'd like to register. Just go to tricitybaptist.org and uh, fill that out. But please be praying as we seek to reach a uh, number of young people, uh, especially this year. The, the theme, the sanctity of life is so critical, especially with what's going on in our country today. So please be praying for that. And then also up at Camp Grace, July 21st to the 23rd is a ladies retreat. This is a change. It was scheduled in August. They moved the camp to July. So please be aware of that, ladies, if you are interested in going, that it is the 21st to the 23rd of July. So now let's uh, open our service in prayer. And then afterwards, we'll continue in meditation as uh, Courtney Wright uh, plays. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you for the gifts that you have given us and for the gift that you have given us in your church. Thank you, Lord, that you have called us to come together to worship you, to serve you together, to encourage one another. We are thankful for the opportunity that we have to be able to do that. I pray, Lord, this evening that as we continue uh, to look into this material about those things in our lives that could keep us from you, that would be a hindrance to our serving you. I pray, Lord, that we'll not only apply these personally, but we'll be able to help others who may be struggling with this as well. We thank you for the encouragement. I pray, Lord, uh, for many, uh, for several of our pastors who are, who are already traveling or will be traveling this week uh, to go to the conference down in South Carolina. We pray that you'll not only give them safety, but a good time of fellowship and Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity for them to be there. We now pray this evening that all that is said and done would glorify you. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to be drawn closer to the image of your son. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
Thank you so much, Courtney and Victoria. You could almost hear the babbling brook and the peaceful sounds of the water in that beautiful arrangement. Thank you so much, ladies, for ministering to us. This next song is a familiar text, but some of you might be a little less familiar with the tune. This is actually, if you can put it up there for us, Alas and Did My Savior Bleed. We recognize this in our song, At the Cross, At the Cross, but actually this tune uh, greatly predates that tune. The, the words were written by Isaac Watts. Some of you know that Isaac Watts was a pastor and he used music as a tool to teach. He used the, the words of music to teach theology to his people. So that's uh, where we got many of our wonderful hymns, Isaac Watts having written many of the great hymns of our faith. So let's stand together and sing together, continuing that theme of Jesus' precious blood. This song, alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Was it? Amen. Well, good singing. I, I would say uh, Charles Wesley probably is my favorite songwriter, and then Isaac Watts, maybe number two or number three. So anything with Wesley or Watts is just, just classic, just fantastic. Uh, Isaac Watts, uh, interesting, you know, that's an interesting bio. You need to study his life and uh, the ups and downs that he uh, experienced. Anyway, uh, great to have you out tonight. Uh, we're going to get right into the video by Jim Berg in just one moment. It's uh, over 40 minutes in length. After it's complete, I'll make a few comments. We'll open up for any question and answers uh, regarding the topic. But uh, we're really gearing up for the Freedom That Lasts addiction ministry. Addiction can be addiction to food, <laughs> you know, overeating. It can be drugs, alcohol, uh, pornography, a number of different uh, excesses uh, that people just need to get help where they can uh, hopefully live in victory over sin. So the topic is really sanctification, how we can grow in grace, knowledge, how we can live victoriously. And uh, so the message tonight will be really uh, foundational theologically for our outreach. And uh, you'll hear that in just a moment. We'll be with Jim Berg this Friday night. Uh, we, we actually will be meeting up with the Oakleys and the Sens. We'll meet with Kevin and Mrs. Hurt up in Dillard, North Carolina, um, Georgia, Dillard, Georgia, earlier in that day. We're working through some strategic planning ideas for our counseling ministry and then uh, we're meeting with uh, Dr. Uh, John Miller and Valerie Miller for dinner. Uh, we're likely going to invite them out next year for our counseling conference. They have a, a ministry of care uh, that they've shared briefly before, but we like to kind of un unload that a little bit more later. So we'll be meeting with the, with the Millers, and then we're going to Faith Baptist Church in Taylor, South Carolina, and we'll be with Jim Berg, and we're going to actually watch their ministry in progress they have about 70 people that come out on a regular basis that are, are looking for help, and they have a pretty large army of workers. Uh, they've been doing it for nearly 10 or so years, so it's, uh, it's not a new ministry. It's a mature work, 
and will give us a lot uh, to glean and, and to learn from. So we're looking forward to being there uh, Friday night. So I'll pray for you know, under, our understanding of how it can work here for us. So Brother Steve, why don't we get right into it? And uh, you should have received notes on this lecture. Did anyone not get the notes? Uh, Karen needs notes. If one of our ushers, if you can just keep your hand up, Jerry Winning, that'd be great. We get one for Jerry and um, Brother Clement over here. Yeah, if you need notes, please help us out, Skip. Just keep them up for a moment, and I think we'll get right to the slide and get right to the program, and then I'll come back up. Well, we began session two here on uh, theological foundations. This will be part one. And in our next session, we'll pick up on this. We're spending a, a very short time on the theological foundations here. And as actually, we're really, mo we moved through that last session pretty quickly. And, uh, we, you know, just because of the nature of things, 10 hours total here, we have to move through everything quickly. One of the things I don't want us to walk away from, like after that last session about the real needs of man, is to give the impression that um, the solutions are always simple or easy. They're not. The human heart is exceedingly complex. And we can have all kinds of divided loyalties and all kinds of stinking thinking, as they say in the world, about a lot of things. And it is the nature of progressive sanctification that as we begin to get serious about our walk with Christ and we spend time in the word and his, light, and his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, it is the nature of light to expose darkness. And the more we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with him and his son cleanses us from all sin. And a lot of that is sin that comes to our mind as we're, as we're growing in the Lord and walking with him. I remember when I first got right with God and had to fill out I, just the, all the people I had to make reconciliation with. It took three pages of a legal pad. All the people I had to talk to, the money I had to pay back for theft and all of the kinds of things I had done. And when I got done with that, it took me two years to pay everything off and get done with it. And in the meantime, while I'm really growing in the Lord and learning what it means to walk in the spirit and to, and to cultivate my spiritual life, he kept adding things to the list. Imagine that. I thought it would be done with three pages. I don't write them down anymore. They just keep, that just keeps growing. You just deal with them as they come along. So what I'm saying is, we, we don't come to anyone and say, well, your problem is you just don't handle life well. Well, that's all of us. And we really, it, you could say, well, you know, I went through that kind of thing once and, and uh, I know what you're going through. Did you know that none of us know what anybody else is going through the way they're going through it? None of us know that. We may have had similar experiences and our problems are common to man. But there are differences in all of that. That's why it's so wonderful to have a faithful high priest who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities and does know us inside and out and says, I understand, come to my throne. I have mercy to forgive you and grace to help you in time of need. So in all of this, I hope none of us get an idea that, um, that we're just dispensing Bible pills we, we don't counsel psychological problems. We don't counsel psychiatric disorders. We, we counsel a person who's struggling with some kind of issue or many issues in his life. And it means getting to know the person. We'll talk about that a great deal when we get into the assessment uh, portion of this. So we're talking about theological truths from God that explain the cause and the solution for addiction. And I mentioned those just quickly uh, before. We're going to look at the nature of man as, as revealed in the creation narrative, the fall, the nature of sin and enslavement and redemption, and what does that mean? And these are crucial for all of our kinds of ministry. And by the way, uh, those of you that are parents, 
You, you know that in working with your children. No two children are alike. In fact, one of them may be so different, you wonder if he got changed with somebody else in the nursery when they were born. You know, maybe he's from another family, you know. Um, and you disciple individuals. If you, know, if you have your notebook uh, on, on the, the first page on session two, <clears throat> I want to read through that just to set the stage here. It says, all treatments are based upon theoretical models underlying us. And, those, and, and by the way, I, I gave a footnote down there. I, I do not use theory here to mean untested scientific uh, speculations as in the theory of evolution, but it's in, in its philosophical sense of the general presuppositions which explain and predict life's experience. <clears throat> Biblical Christianity has a theory, and we're not talking about something that is just kind of an idea we're floating around out there hoping to prove it. The theory is all of the phys uh, philosophical presuppositions that the Bible gives us and says, this is how life works. Now, we don't call it a theory. We don't even call it a philosophy necessarily. We call it a theology, but it all means the same. <clears throat> all treatments are based on theoretical models, the a theory of some sort about how life is supposed to work. These are underlying assumptions that state the goal of treatment and therefore a description of success. Theoretical models also present the nature of the problem, the methodology of treatment, and the structures through which help is delivered. The models adopted usually reference some source of scientific authority. And again, the, 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 uh, the data, the, even the research data on human hearts, uh, on the human being, is going to be severely skewed if you don't take into, um, uh, into consideration that at heart, he has a sinful nature and does not want God in the picture, and he cannot survive without God in the picture. And you remove all of that and try to figure and tinker with man's problems, you'll never come up with the right solution. So all of the research is going to be skewed in that way. Second paragraph says, those who believe the Bible, however, begin with the truth regarding God and his works. That truth includes God's teaching about man, the way the world works, the ultimate purposes for man, and the God-ordained processes of change. A skewed view of man Skewed view of the nature of his problem and a skewed, a skewed view of the nature of the solution can achieve only minimal effectiveness when divorced from the grandest realities of God himself in the spiritual nature of God's highest creation, man. However, for the believer, sobriety must be a byproduct of reconciliation with God and others and of increased growth in Christ's likeness if God is to be honored. If relationship with God is not restored, and growth in Christ's likeness not intentionally pursued, the sobriety, while beneficial from a human standpoint, and, and boy, when somebody, when somebody does become sober by going to an AA group or something like that, and they become sober, they're a better father, they're a better husband, they're a better co-worker, they're a better citizen. And, and that's helpful. I'm not minimizing that at all. But notice that statement. Um, while the sobriety, while beneficial from a human standpoint, it is wood, hay, and stubble from God's standpoint. And this is an important statement. God blesses only that fruit which he produces in repentant and dependent lives. When God looks at us, what pleases him? It's the fact that we are blood-bought children bathed in the blood of his son and becoming like his son. That's what he honors. And the only way that happens is because he does it. We have to cooperate with it. We say in Freedom the Last every Friday night, you do what you do because you are what you are. I, I stole in high school. I didn't become a thief because I stole. I stole because I had a heart of a thief. We do what we do because we are what we are. And to change what we do, we have to cooperate with God to change what we are. And that's the progressive sanctification process. God blesses only the fruit which he produces in repentant and dependent lives. The biblical presuppositions are truths for addiction ministry. In Appendix C, and I want to turn there in just a moment are derived from God's words to us. 
and from the foundation of effective and form the foundation of effective ministry to believing men and women. See Appendix C and its corresponding endnotes for the scriptural support for the truths summarized in this session. Ministry effort towards the lost must focus on pointing them to Jesus Christ for salvation, whereby they are made children of God as they repent and believe the gospel. These must be a part of the theological framework, the theory of ministry to others if our efforts are to be God-blessed and effective. And I want you to turn back to Appendix C for just a moment. These are the truths that must be on our lips. This is our worldview. As we parent our children, as we work with our disciples, as we minister to one another, as we try to grow in Christ ourselves. I used to tell our daughters when they were home in high school, I, I loved having teenagers. It was wonderful. Finally, all the neurons were connecting. And, you know, they go through junior high, that kind of pre-people stage. And, and then, then the neurons start connecting and you can actually disciple. And it's just thrilling to watch them develop a relationship with God themselves. And I would tell them, not in any kind of scornful way, as we're discussing problems at, at the supper table often, that most people's biggest problem is they don't know how to solve their problem. That's what that secular research is saying. Most people's biggest problem is they don't know how to solve their problem. Everybody has problems. All of us have problems. I got problems. And I, I used to tell my daughters, I, I will never, I am quite confident, I will never leave you a large financial legacy. I may be able to pay for my casket when I leave, you know, uh, and uh, you can have my car. Um, but I want to leave you a legacy of wisdom. I want you to know how to live life God's way. And if I can do that, I will have disciples. I don't know how many times I told them that. I just wanted them to keep in mind. This is what this is all about. Parenting is not about raising a kid who doesn't embarrass you too much. It's not about raising a kid who will make you proud. It's about raising a child God can use so that one day, my, I, I realize one day the biggest day of my daughter's lives and my wife's life will be the day they stand before Jesus Christ and give an account of how useful they were to him. And part of my accountability will be how much did I help get them ready for the biggest day of their lives to give that account to God for how useful they That means they must become wise. And there's a whole book that tells us how to do that. The Bible and particular pa passages in, in Proverbs and so forth. But these are, these are some presuppositions. I'm not going to read through all of these because you, you, all of you can read them yourselves. But I just want to highlight, there are biblical presuppositions about God. He created all things, and whatever God creates intrinsically shows his existence, power, and wisdom. Those, our kids need to know that. And these are part of our conversation. Do you know why this is happening? It's because God made us this way. We're image bearers of God. We're going to talk about that later tonight. There are biblical presuppositions about the nature of man. God created man as an image bearer of himself, rational and, and uh, relational and moral. God created man as a co-ruler. You can go down that list. That these are the things we must know about God, or, about ourselves as man, and, and be teaching our children. I'm not saying we catechize on this necessarily, but this ought to be a part of our conversation. Point C, biblical uh, presuppositions about the redemption and restoration of man. That's crucial. And point D, biblical presuppositions about ministry to those suffering from enslaving behaviors. Number one under that, God's goal is the redemption and the restoration of the sinner to himself, not sobriety. Sobriety for the glory of God is a byproduct of Christian maturity. It's not its goal. That's why in freedom at last, we don't, we don't even really deal with the drug. We really don't deal, we, we try to get this person growing in the Lord. Now, if, if there's some danger things we don't want them continuing to do, and we'll try to intervene whenever we can on that. But the main emphasis is on, you got to become a different kind of person. So we get them sober, they're still the same kind of person. They're not going to stay sober long. Point number two, God's recovery program, to use the world's terms, and I'm not embracing that, God's recovery program is sanctification. And point three, God's support group is the local church. When you abandon God's way of doing anything, there are no good solutions left. 
God's way of preparing the next generation is through the family. You abandon that, and there aren't any good solutions left. A, a, a public school, even a Christian school, can't make that up. We're trying to do that in America. We, we're, we're destroying the family on all kinds of, of, of ways, and then trying to make up for that in public school, public education. There, once you abandon the family of God's way of raising the next generation, there aren't any good solutions left. Now, does that mean we don't try? No, I mean, at, at BJU, we have a lot of people who didn't, weren't raised in, in good families, and we, we disciple and minister, and as the church, as a support group, the people of God, we rally around and we do everything we can. But God's first intention is that happen in the family, so that when this young person has a family, he knows what to do because he's seen us disciple him in that way. Point four, addictions are not psychiatric disorders or diseases. We'll come back to this again. They are dependency disorders of those who have forsaken God's rule and sought solutions to problems by living independently of God. And number five, when the normal things don't seem to work, don't abandon the normal things, intensify the normal things. So the normal things are Bible reading and prayer and assembly with God's people and discipleship and accountability and all of that kind of thing. When that doesn't seem to work, we don't abandon it and go off after some esoteric worldly way to do that. We intensify all of those normal things. That is the beauty of a resident program for a, a, a resident biblical counseling oriented program for, for addictions, because you can intensify all the normal things. They're going to go to Bible study four times every day. They're going to be memorizing tons of scripture. They're going to have prayer times every day. We intensify all the normal things and intensify the counseling at the time like that. So those are important presuppositions and ones we, we really need to be familiar with. And I've, I've listed in the end notes on that scriptures that will help that and you know, just for your own study, that's a good, if I want a biblical worldview of something, take this and, and look up the scripture references, look up the cross references, read books on those things. This will give you a good handle on, on the whole process here. So let's look at the creation end of it. Uh, Genesis 1, 27 to 28 says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let him have dominion over all the earth. Uh, so God created man in his own image and the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. And God made, and, and Adam was made a spiritual being and a physical being. He had a soul and he's made as an image bearer of God. That, he, he was made to fellowship with God and that's what those arrows, God is, God is ministering to his soul and he is responding to God. Adam and Eve were made dependent creatures. They weren't made independent. Any attempt to make man independent will fail. We were all created dependent people. All an AA group can do is help a person switch addictions, switch dependencies from the substance to the group. And if you're having trouble, you just up the amount of time you're with the group. All it does is switch dependencies. Now, the person is easier to live with and perhaps more productive, but understand he's still dependent. And that's why in Freedom at Last, I, I say often um, freedom isn't found in a facility. It's not found in a program, even freedom that lasts, unless that facility and program and counselor are pointing you to Jesus Christ, who is the only source of freedom that lasts. Otherwise, all you're doing is switching dependencies on this earth. And switching dependencies, uh, one dependency that you have without God to another dependency without God, and you don't get to define him as you want him to be. There's only one God, and his name is Jesus. And without him, all we've done is switch dependencies. And the whole point of freedom at last is to help switch a dependency back to God where it ought to be. All of us were made dependent creatures. We were made rational beings, that is, we were made logical. We were made to look at what God has said about the world and follow his thoughts after him and think about everything the same way God thinks about it. We were made rational in that way. Beavers don't do that. We were made rational beings. 
I, I've told you before in, in other venues, if beavers were rational, they wouldn't be making dams out of sticks and mud after thousands of years. They'd be making them out of steel reinforced concrete. They're instinctive animals, they're not rational. Now there's some basic instinctive problem solving, all of them go through, but they're not improving everything around them. We don't have better bird nests this year than we have 20 years ago. You know, they're not rational beings, but we are. We're made relational beings. We're made to have fellowship with God and with the other image bearing creatures God created. And if you put somebody in a rat cage, you put somebody in a cage, it's, it's going to have a fundamental effect on his, on his being. That's why solitary confinement next to execution is the most severe form of punishment our society knows to have for somebody. Isolate him from other human beings. Now, for believer, a Russian pastor who's doing a sentence in a gulag and is all by himself has his God and can flourish even in prison by himself because he does have a relationship. We're worshiping beings. We are going to think something is really glorious and we're going to ascribe praise to it. Listen to somebody talk about the party they had last week and how glorious it was. That's a, that's a worship term. Finding glory high value in something on this earth and say, and praising it and saying, that's the best thing that ever happened. I can't wait to do that again. There is worship going on. It's what we say when, you know, when we're getting engaged and married, we say, I, we say he worships the ground she walks. On. Well, we know what that means. It's, 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 she's just so glorious. He just wants to be around her all the time. That's, that's not a bad thing unless that worship turns idolatrous in, in, in what we call wor what we might say is worship. As highly esteeming somebody you love is not a bad thing. Um, we were made emotional beings with capa capable of love for God and our neighbor. We we're creative beings. Beavers aren't real creative. I mean, they can do some wonderful things, but they're not creative. I have students every once in a while when they're talking about having their devotions or leading their family in devotions. And this guy would say, this, this married guy would say, well, you know, I just, I, I'm just not a very creative guy. I don't know how to, my, my dad never led in devotions at home and I don't know how to do this. I'm not a very creative guy. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. Did you lower your wife's dating standards while you were dating? Yeah, we did some things we shouldn't have done. I said, don't tell me you're not creative. If you want something badly enough, you'll figure out a way to get it. That's the nature of our sin nature. If we want something, we can figure out a way to get it and cover it up and make it look like it wasn't us and rationalize it to ourselves. Men and women, that is creativity. We are all amazingly creative people. Just watch how we sin. So you can't tell me you're not creative. I'm being a student. I watch creative people all the time sitting in my office. And we were made dependent beings. Now, none of these things can be factored in during studies in RAS. We were created in God's image in order to reflect his excellence to each other. We ought to be living in such a way before each other where we watch each other under pressure and say, I want to be like what I see in her. I want that. That's what he intends. That we see that there's an excellence of Christ likeness developing us as a fruit of his spirit and walking in the spirit and, and not fulfilling the lust of our flesh so that we are actually changing to be more like Jesus. And people say, how do I get that? Well, that's, what, that's what happened to Paul and Silas. You beat, you beat Paul and Silas bloody and throw them in stocks and, and the jailer stands around and says, how do I get what you have? That's impact. We were made to find in our relationship with God and his words all that we need to flourish as the epitome of his creation. I've just been reading through Philippians 
uh, this, this week and part of it passed through Philippians as part of my devotions and just noticing again how much the theme of joy is there. These are not people with easy lives. A lot of people in the New Testament churches were slaves of somebody else. This is not an easy life. They weren't guaranteed breaks every two hours for 10 or 20 minutes and wage and hour laws and all kinds of other perks. Their lives were very hard. And you know what Paul said his joy was in 2 Corinthians? He said, my joy is the joy of you all. What just tickles me pink is watching you get joy in God. That is thrilling. That is how we were made to function. That's the human person flourishing, even in adversity. So science can be helpful as it attempts to investigate and organize and utilize the non-human created order. Secular scientific studies about humans, however, however are, they're seriously flawed because Scientific study consciously excludes the most important data about human beings, their spiritual image-bearing status. This would be like a mechanic who's not aware of the electrical system in an automobile attempting to fix an ailing car. He can tinker with the mechanics and the fuel delivery system, but can never make it function optimally. He's not even aware of an electrical system that sparks the fuel, charges the batteries, runs the accessories, and so forth. He really can't fix that thing if he doesn't know that part of it. Secular science ignores the spiritual component of mankind, which is made in the image of God and is designed to function only in fellowship with God. The human heart shrivels without fellowship with God. Consequently, secular interpretations of the data they discover about the psychological, that is the soul related problems of disordered human beings will be skewed. The remedies will always miss a mark of pointing a man to a reconciled and growing relationship with his creator. One of the most important things we can do with our children when they are three years old is when they hit their sister with a hairbrush, say, when you, were please, when you hit your sister, were you pleasing Jesus or pleasing yourself? I was pleasing myself. But what do you need to tell Jesus when you chose to please yourself instead of pleasing him? And you teach him how to be reconciled to God, and what do you need to say to your sister? To be reconciled to your sister. You can start that even before they're saved. We're doing that with three-year-olds before they're converted. They can still respond to God the best they know how. While we rejoice in some of science's symptom-relieving discoveries, like how to calm the body during a panic attack, or how to re uh, recognize and address the dissociation of a trauma victim, or how to restore extended sleep loss with a temporary mild sedative, we must never forget that no one but God can remedy the problems of suffering and sin at their core. No one but God can infuse a soul with the joy and peace, fruitfulness and contentment God wants to give him, even in the midst of trials. In other words, only God can quiet a noisy soul, to coin a phrase. I want us to look at the fall for just a moment. That, that image-bearing aspect of, of us with God is just really crucial. We're not like any other, we're not like the animals. And only God who's the one who made the soul can, sell a, can, can tell us how the soul interacts with the body and how the soul is transformed into a different kind of soul to be more like its creator whose image it bears. Only God can do that. Science cannot tell us that. The new book by Jeremy, uh, by, um, yeah, by Jeremy Pierre, is an excellent book uh, called The Dynamic Heart in Daily Life. In that, he has a diagram similar to the one that's on your screen and in your notes, that we have this human heart, or we generally think of that as mind, will, and emotion. But it's acted upon by many things. Remember, we're created dependent. We were created to need outside information to flourish. We didn't come with the software to know everything about the world. And before the fall, all of that information came through their senses of a perfect garden and through their soul with communion with God. And God told them, Adam and Eve had to be told a lot of things. They had to be told who they were. 
They had to be told what their limitations were, what their responsibilities were, what their restrictions were. They didn't come with all of that software built in. That had to come from outside. God made us to need information from outside to survive, and he made us to be changed by the information we receive. Whatever you take in, whatever you believe is going to change you. So we have all these influences. We, the, the most important influence that ought to be in our lives is God himself through his word. And then God put us in community, made us relational beings, and, and we're put in families and communities and church families. There ought to be input coming from there. Now, on a fallen world, a lot of that input can be very bad. That's why I need input from God constantly to filter all of the other input I'm receiving. I'm also receiving, the other thing that's interacting on my heart are all of my circumstances because my heart, my, especially my sinful nature, has an opinion about everything that happens to me. And it has a way that I think that ought to be fixed. And who's to blame for that? And it's certainly not me. I mean, my circumstances weigh on my heart and my heart, if it's not getting instruction from God, is going to make the wrong interpretation of what's happening to me. And then myself talks to me. Do you notice that? And we get in trouble when we listen to ourself instead of talk to ourselves. Martin Lloyd Jones, in his book um, *Spiritual Depression: Its Causes and Cures*, has a wonderful passage about that. So that when you wake up in the morning, you start talking to yourself. Who's that talking to you? It's yourself. It's telling you, you don't have to get out of bed. You don't need that. That shouldn't have happened to you. You don't have to do that today. And he said, you're going to get in trouble listening to yourself. You need to talk to yourself. And he's talking about Psalm 42. And that's what he said. That's what the psalmist did. He said, why art thou cast down, my, oh, my soul? You hope in God. He said he preached a little sermon to himself. You, and you have to have a sermon to preach to yourself if you're going to preach to yourself. And that's going to come from the Bible. These factors are very important in understanding how a person who never would consider an addictive substance begins to choose it and how that choice is reinforced. By the way, the studies also show with children, this is secular and they're not taking any spiritual effect into this consideration, that just trying to isolate your child from all of the bad in the world is not helpful to him. In other words, it doesn't mean he has to go out and try drugs or anything like that. But if he, he's not even aware of the danger of it and the problems of it, and he sees any, any he, he comes into high school or whatever, and he sees other people, and he's not thinking about it, say, well, that's a stupid thing to do. But under some trial or some provocation, it's like, oh, I wonder what that's like. And before long, they're down the wrong path. They haven't been talked to about, uh, about these kinds of things all along the way. I, and I'll, I'll give you some... I'll give you some parenting um, help that was really helped to us. We, we worked it so that our daughters, I mean, we worked our arrangements and summers so that our daughters, when they became of age to do so, were counseling up at the wilds in the summertime. They could be working somewhere and making money. And, and we did have an advantage because of, of a tuition benefit. Um, uh, but as much as we could, we wanted them at the wilds. Why? Because our daughters got to be in the same cabin with girls who were anorexic, girls who had been on drugs, girls who had been alcoholics, girls who had, been, who had had abortions, girls had had all these kinds of problems, and they were in their cabins, and they're the counselors, and they're the, they're the other, the cabin mates during that time in a controlled environment where there are people around them telling, here's how we do that. Here's how we work with that. And they were exposed to everything they would ever see on the streets, but in a controlled environment where they were taught, this is what we do about this. And they saw the effects of it in the lives of those girls up close. You can't isolate them from what's happening in their world, but you have to expose them to the bad parts of it under a controlled situation like that. And, and, I, and I'm not giving you advice about how to go about that in your setting. I'm just saying isolating them and making sure that they never they never even hear about drugs or, and without sitting down and uh, we would take our girls through documentaries and let them watch things and we talk about things i wanted them to know under my tutelage what that world was like out there and what the answers are for that 
If they're going to meet these things, their heart has to respond right to those things. So all of this, because of the fall, is marred. And now we're a self-centered being, we're a God-avoiding being, and we are a disintegrating being. And these are the problems we face in a fallen human condition. We took a whole quarter to study through these in Sunday school here recently. We, we, don't, we, don't, counsel medical, uh, we don't counsel psychiatric disorders. We counsel these human problems. These are the main problems that humans on the planet face that they don't know how to handle well. Uncertainty and vulnerability. Adversity. Injustice. Overwhelming situations. Guilt and lust and temptation, misplaced dependency, interpersonal conflict, unfulfilled desires and discontentment, disobedience and immature heart motivations for obedience, and decision-making and determining the will of God. Our, our children face all of these things growing up, and so do we. And did you know that God has provisions in himself and through his word and his promises for how to handle every one of those kinds of problems? Every one of them. For an exercise in one of, one of my, my classes this semester, uh, this past semester, I had them take these 10 problems of human suffering and, and, and loss and find three verses for each one of these that showed what God said about himself to people facing that problem. And I said, don't just pick your favorite verse. I want to know the context is God in a context of some facing adversity that God says, Here, here's who I am to you. Find three verses that's what, what, of what God shows about himself to people in that situation and three verses that are promises God makes to people in those situations. The feedback I got was astonishing. This is the best thing I've ever done. I've been going through half a dozen of these right now. This gave me direction. We have to help people take the words of the living God to handle the problems of life. This is why people take drugs and choose self-destructive and enslaving behaviors. We have to be able to recognize these things. When a little kid, when a third grader comes in and, and two of her best friends have turned on her and they're starting to gossip about her, that's pretty overwhelming for a third grader. It feels an awful lot like injustice. And it makes life really hard because you don't want to go back to school again. So what do you do? You sit down with your child and a Bible and say, here's what God says to us and things like that. Here's what we're going to do. When they get junior high, junior high girls have a lot of worst days of their life. And it's a wonderful discipling time. And the neat thing about teenagers is that you, you don't solve the problems of a teenager in minutes, you spend hours talking about the thing and letting them talk and listening to them. And it's, I miss that with my daughter. They call on the phone with other kinds of problems they're having now in ministry and wanting to know what to do. But we have to teach them how to solve problems God's way. These are the sources of our suffering and our loss and are designed to drive us to God, not away from him. And my sinful bent wants to go away from God to something else when this stuff happens. Man is a very complex physical, spiritual being, a unified duality. That is, he's two parts in one. His struggles cannot be reduced to imbalanced body chemistry and neurological dysfunction. He is a disintegrating being without God. Fellowship, you notice in the diagram, his fellowship with God is destroyed, and he is not talking to God, he's talking to himself. Jeremiah 2.13, this is written to God's people, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and have hewn out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Addicted believers fight a spiritual war. Ed Welch, in his great book, Addiction, a Banquet in the Grave, says addictions are ultimately a disorder of worship. Will we worship ourselves and our own desires or will we worship the true God? Mark Shaw, a good friend and uh, uh, addiction counselor, addiction is a worship disorder and not a man-made theoretical disease. Addictions, as I read to you earlier, addictions are not psychiatric disorders or diseases. They are the dependency disorders 
of those who's, who face life's challenges without God. They turn to the creation for solutions to life's challenges. By the way, that is the same for chemical dependencies. That is the same for a person who turns to food for comfort and overeats or restricts eating or a person who turns to pornography when his mood is down and he wants something fulfilling. This is a person trying to solve the problems of life without God. And it can be sports. It can be the, the way to veg out is just, just watch another ball game. It's a way to avoid handling life's problems. My son-in-law was telling me about a man who uh, came up to him and was talking about his own son-in-law and said, my son-in-law spends seven hours a day on video games. He's married and has four children. I say, well, that's horrible stewardship. That is a man escaping the hard things of life. And he didn't just develop that seven year, that seven hour habit overnight. That's been going on a long time and it just got more and more as the problems of life got more and more. Well, what does God say to us? Isaiah 55, seven, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy unto our God for he will abundantly pardon. Repentance is the way back on him. And then building a life of dependence. And Jesus said, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a, a wise man which built his house upon a rock. We, we emphasize that constantly in Freedom at Last. We're here listening to God, hearing God. Now the goal is to go out and do this. Key truths for freedom. We say these in, in our program. Jesus Christ is the only source of freedom that lasts. God's recovery program is sanctification, and God's support group is a local church. To help someone effectively, just to summarize, we must keep in mind God's initial intention for man, and that's as displayed in the creator's design to reflect his image. We have to understand the initial intention for man. We have to understand what went wrong in the fall and what God's intention is for the restoration of all things. Only to the extent that we can help someone get back on God's path to the restoration of all things will be truly helpful and biblical. When we discuss care, when we go through those uh, competencies and we get to the R, which is restore, we'll examine more detail God's path to restoration and freedom in the midst of our suffering and loss. I just want to give us this bold sweep, this narrative of who we were made to be as image bearers of God and co-rulers with God on the earth. I think I may have told you this story, uh, this story before, but uh, some of you haven't heard it. One, one of the first men I was working with he, on a Wednesday night before church, he was a little bit cocky, and, uh, and, and I don't believe he was saved. He moved out of town shortly after that. But he said, um, Jim, I, I got a question for you. No preacher's been able to answer this for me. What's wrong with marijuana? God made plants. I'm just kind of a little cocky, and I said, well, God made you naked. Why are you wearing clothes? Well, I don't know, I'd get arrested if I don't. I said, yeah, a lot of things changed with the fall. God did make marijuana, but he didn't make it so you could, so you could solve your problems with it and try to alter your mood so you don't have to think about the bad things that are happening in your life. I said, do you know that God made you as a co-ruler with him on the earth? And I read in, 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 from Genesis 2 about God making us rulers with him on the earth. And I said, did you know that God made you a ruler of plants and we have a plant ruling you? How mixed up is that? Oh, I never thought of that way. Listen, how God made us and what the creation mandate was for us to be rulers with him on this earth. Not slaves to the creation, but rulers over the creation. That says a lot about God's intention. We need to understand those things. And this is just a broad sweep here. We're going to get into the weeds a little bit more as we go along, but this gives us kind of the big picture for us. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you that in your word you have given to us, you say all things that pertain to life and godliness, to the knowledge of you, the one that has called us to virtue, to Christ-likeness, and to, and to glory. And I pray that we as your people would take seriously who you made us to be, and take seriously the danger that lurks in our own souls and our flesh, and take seriously the sanctification process through your word, by your spirit, 
that is the answer for all of those things. Help us to that end. Make us more effective disciples of you, our Lord. Make us more effective disciple makers of those you bring across our path, I pray. In your precious name, amen. Amen. Great. Amen. Um, hopefully uh, you're benefiting and are blessed by Brother Berg. He's an excellent teacher, is he not? He's very good, very helpful. Uh, a couple things I'll hit on, and then we'll open up for any questions and answers on tonight's topic, the theological basis for our ministry. On the bottom of page 18, uh, you're going to see these three truths just repeated, repeated, repeated. And we've got to be online together on this. So Jesus Christ is the only source of freedom that lasts. And uh, he talks about where with the person who's a drunkard, that sobriety is not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to know the Lord. And a byproduct of that new relationship is that God gives grace for them to overcome their, their drunkenness. Uh, that's, that's a big difference than with uh, most of the programs out there that uh, are obviously divorced from God. So Jesus Christ is the only source of freedom that lasts. Second, secondly, uh, God's recovery program is sanctification. We've got to be convinced this is what we're saying is that God's spirit using his word is the program. And that's where we're going to camp out on. Uh, how do we apply the scriptures? How, do, how are we led by the spirit of God to, to help people? So God's, quote, recovery program is sanctification. Uh, thirdly, God's support group is the believing family and the local church. And that's where when we start Freedom That Last, what we're saying to our, our friends in the community that will come to us and people we know is that this, this indeed is God's support group. So I've shared a story about my uncle, my uncle Bob, um, like many of our family members, terrible alcoholics, drunks. And uh, to Bob's credit, he wanted to change. He did not want to live that life uh, the rest of his life. He was destroying another marriage, uh, hurting other relationships. And so he began to go to one of these programs. And uh, through the program, um, the goal of it was not salvation. And what did take place was a transfer of dependence from alcohol to a dependence upon the group. Uh, he began to attend this group in the area, multiple locations, multiple days. And that's, that was his fix. He needed that. He could not uh, survive uh, the temptation of alcohol without the group. And so when I met with my uncle at my dad's funeral, and we talked through some of these things, I was really proud of him that he was no longer getting drunk and, and doing so much damage with, with alcohol. But it was like a wall was put up where he, he, was, he was not interested in salvation or sanctification or a church because he, he had it fixed. He, had, he fixed it. He fixed it. And it, it really struck me then that we as, a, as Christians, we, we can do better than this. We have a plan. We have God's plan. It's salvation. It's sanctification. And uh, his support group is, is the local church. Uh, on page 77, I don't think we made copies of the appendix. Is that accurate? So we'll make sure we get those copied the next time. Um, but I, I had all the notes. So on page 77, it kind of walks through those points and extends those thoughts. And there's a lot of value on page 78 where it gives you all the verses supporting those premises or those presuppositions. So we'll get those notes to you. So I know some of you are scrambling, trying to find where is that, and they weren't in your notes. So I apologize for that. Um, number of things that just stood out to me, but I want to get to your questions and anything that stood out to you that might be helpful to us as a group. So what are some of the takeaways for you? Something that, hey, that, that resonated with me. And he has so many illustrations of truths. Uh, they are very, very, very helpful. Like the, the birds, you know, we have nests in our backyard. You know, they're no better than, they're no better than last year, 10 years ago. I really like that. But for us, we're, we're, our designs improve and improve and improve, or they should at least. So uh, something that caught your attention and or a question on anything that was brought up here. Okay, Brother Bob, you got, you got a mic coming at you. Okay, thank you. I'm fascinated by this term and this concept of vandalism. You know, I've never really heard anybody until he came and, and, and kind of expounded on this idea that, you know, the, these kinds of sins, when they're taken in, they, they, they are a form of really Satan's vandalism on our on our bodies, on our relationships, on really everything that it, that it touches. And it's just it's such a clever way to look at it. 
Yeah, the great description. Satan's trying to rob you <laughs> and ultimately rob God of his glory because of how he's stealing from your whatever, your mind, your body, your life, your relationships. Good. Excellent. Excellent. Someone else, a takeaway or question on the topic tonight? Anything that comes to your mind? Yep, go ahead. Hezekiah. <laughs> Hezekiah will be preaching this Wednesday, by the way, on verse 5 of Jude, and I uh, can't wait to listen to it myself. Um, something that just stood out to me, he was talking about um, you are what you do, um, and that was just, that was really convicting because sometimes we're like, oh, you know, I'll just stop doing this. Um, I'll put that habit away. Uh, but we don't realize that the root problem is that we are living in the sin um, and we need to change what we are through Christ and sanctification. So yeah. that's really convicting. That is convicting. We need to change what we are so we change what we do. That, that's a very catchy phrase. We need to change what we are so we then change what we do. The world gets it just the opposite, if at all. Okay, excellent, excellent point. All right, another comment or question? Any other comments, questions on this tonight? Paul, are you looking for something to say there? You're, look, you're looking around. Okay, Jerry, go ahead. Uh, do you address the physical, chemical addiction first, or do you address the salvation first? Yes. Because salvation obviously is the goal. Yes. But if a person has a chemical addiction, it, can they comprehend the gospel as they should before that chemical addiction is addressed in some way? Yeah, really good question. Uh, I know there are times where, where I will be counseling someone and I, I may be sensing there's some things really messed up physically, whatever, and I'm not a doctor. I will almost always inevitably say I'm not Barbo Komodo. I'm not a doctor. Uh, I do recommend, though, that you get a physical and you get some blood work done. I'd like you to do that. So I'm not discounting the physical part uh, of this and maybe the chemical addiction aspect. But uh, I am going to, to give them the gospel right from the beginning because the, the power of the word of God um, is, is just so strong. I remember we had a guy at, at Clemson. His name was Jim Gunlock. Gunlock and uh, he said, Pastor, can we, can we um, have an air attack on the football stadium? I said, that is awesome. Let, let's attack Death Valley. 80,000 skip back then. I don't know, 75. It's what, 85, 90,000 now, whatever Death Valley is. So here's, here's, let's attack the stadium. So first quarter, we're going to rent a plane and it's going to fly around the stadium. Romans 3, 10, Romans 3, 10. Okay. Second quarter, Romans 5, 8, <laughs> Romans 10, 9, third quarter, fourth quarter, you know, Romans 10, 13. We're going to, we're going to do an air attack. Okay. So folks can see the gospel, all football game. Pretty cool. I said, Jim, how much is this going to cost us? He said, don't worry about it. We'll make, we'll get the money. So we had uh, this plan for an air attack, and then we had a plan for a ground attack when uh, 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 Purple Floyd came into town. Uh, I think Purple Floyd, Green Floyd, Pink Floyd, okay, Pink Flamingo, Pink Floyd, okay. So we had a ground attack with Pink Floyd. We, we thought that the airplane wasn't the best way to attack that concert of a full stadium. So what we did, we took tracks, and uh, we went to the Porto Johns, they're all drunk and high and stoned out of their minds, uh, tailgating, and they're all in line at the Port of Johns by hundreds of Port of Johns. So our strategy was let's go right to the Port of Johns. And we just handed track after track. They're all standing in line. They're doing nothing but, you know, whatever. And normally, what I'd say, Jerry, here's a track in the condition you're in right now. You can read it right now if you want, but do me a favor just put it in your pocket. When you sober up in the morning, read it, okay? But some of them are reading it. They're just, you know, they can hardly read and they're, you know, stumbling around reading the track. And that's just fine because the power of God, the gospel can, can deal with a drunk in front of the Port of John at a, at a Purple Floyd concert. And uh, we had just, you know, you talk about handing gospel tracks that you have a very, uh, logistically, it's perfect to intercept folks at the Port of John. Okay. It's just, just brilliant. We, we handed out more tracks than I think we, we had. We just handed them all out. Okay. So to answer your question, yes, I'm going to give the gospel out. We, we minimize the power of the gospel, and uh, it is the power of God unto salvation. And so we're going to do that, not discounting the other factors that may be involved. But I'm going to always just trust God to, to break through. And you think of people who are drunks that were saved, even in, the, in a bad state with some other addiction issues, 
Billy Sunday, you know, drunk on the on the on the sidewalk outside of the the uh, the uh, uh, what's the Pacific Garden, um, the um, what's it called the uh, who's the mission the mission uh, Pacific Garden whatever the mission is there. So yeah, a good question. Someone else question comment question comment. So what do you think about his comment, your biggest day? So we have, we have Taylor and I'm thinking, okay, July's right around the corner. We probably should get together before this event, probably. It's not your fault. We need to probably talk about this, um, get the right day, right guy, right words and all that kind of stuff. So uh, would you say for Taylor, her greatest day is, is gonna be in July? Would you say that? So I was thinking, you know, my, we have an anniversary today. This is a great day. This is a great day. So you have to be born to have a great day. So birth is an important day. Death is an important day. And between birth and death, what are the potentially two great events? The greatest event would be what? Salvation. So you, you better be born twice so you only die once, right? So you, you, so you, you bet, you know, between birth and death, salvation is the greatest. After that, you know, marriage is pretty, pretty, pretty high up there, right? So he said that the Bema seat, he didn't use those words, but he was referencing the judgment seat of Christ being the greatest day. What do you think of that? What do you think of that? Do you ever think of that? That you're going to come before the Lord Jesus as a Christian, not being judged for your sins. That's all he been handed at the cross. But you're before Christ and your life is assessed. And he passes judgment on the quality of your works in life that was spent for Jesus. Do you ever think of that? That's a big day. That's a really, 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 really big day. And I, I don't think we think about it enough. Uh, we should be thinking, okay, I'm, I'm going to give an account for this life that I have lived. My motives, my message, my manner. That's really convicting. So each of us have an appointment. We're going to be um, evaluated, <laughs> assessed, and judged by Jesus Christ. And that's inescapable. Every knee shall bow. For the Christian, it's in a different context than those at the white throne. But every knee will bow. Okay. So that, that really struck out when I, when I heard him uh, comment the way he did. Okay. Any other last thoughts before we close tonight? Any other last? Yes. Sure, Paco. Yes. So Pastor Skip can get you section one. Debbie's out of town this weekend. Um, Heather, where's Heather? Somewhere I saw Heather. Can we get up? Can you get Paco session one? You don't have to do it right this moment, but uh, if you can do it in like two minutes, that'd uh, be great. <laughs> uh, but if you can get that to Paco, okay. And we should probably have last week's and the, the cumulative of those notes available. Thank you. Any other question, thought? Anything else? These are very basic truths, I understand, but very, very, very needful. And again, I'll just repeat and I'll close in prayer. P people who might come to give us a try, they've in many cases tried a lot of things, tried a lot of things, and they haven't worked. They have not worked, or they have not worked for long. There's been no ongoing victory. And you can be sure that as we talk through salvation, creation, uh, the fall, salvation type themes, this is going to be foreign to them. Just the very view of our nature. So when the world thinks of our nature, do, do, does the world view us as basically good people, good as to our nature, or is it typically seen as bad, depraved, and fallen? <laughs> So if you're a Muslim, and you're not, I understand that, but if you're a Muslim and you're, you're a Quran theologian, they'll tell you the basic nature of man, it's good. It's good. So if it's good, you really don't need a redeemer because it's pretty good. Pretty good. So we're dealing with people saying your heart is desperately wicked and who can really know it? And that's going to be a message they have not heard. They have not heard the fallen condition. And uh, as a result, they have not seen the pronounced need of a savior. And uh, our savior is the one who can save them and change their life and get them in a sanctification program in a, in a group setting the church.
And I like the idea of intensifying. Uh, I won't go into all the details. I was with a guy yesterday. I'd count, I have counseled him, I don't know, hundreds of hours might be an overstatement, maybe not. His sins were very, very intense, very, very intense, very deeply entrenched habits, very, very deeply entrenched. So when you're dealing with someone with deeply entrenched sin, did you catch what Jim was saying here? You, you, you still go to the normal thing, normal things, which are the word of God, prayer, congregating with the people of God, things of this, in, the, in this range of ideas. So this guy, he had such deep, deeply rooted problems, and he would try a little of the Bible and try a little bit of prayer, but it, it didn't work. It didn't work. So what's the temptation at that, at that point for people? This doesn't work. So let's try something else, right? Let's try something else. Well, what else is there? I love what Jim was saying. You, you know, you, you, once you go outside of God's solutions, you're done. You, there is no help. So with this guy, to his credit, by the grace of God, he intensified his Bible study. He intensified his prayer life. He intensified some of his accountability. He intensified his memory work. And today he's a much, 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 much more useful servant. A wonderful talk uh, with him. And I know the history. And it was the word of God that broke through some yucky, yucky, entrenched sins, twisted behavior. So the power of the word of God, we, we intensify our efforts. So when we talk about freedom at last, have a ministry. This is an intense ministry. It's, it's taking the biblical truths and, and putting them into place and uh, working through them. Okay. Anyone else comment? I'll close. Anything else? Yes, Larry. So first question, Larry brought up, excellent question. This ministry we're talking about is it mostly for the unsaved. Well, that's one, one application. Uh, we're going to have people who are lost that are going to come, and we're going to see them trust Christ as their Savior, and the Lord's going to start a work from the inside out. And that's going to be really fun to watch. But it would not surprise me that most of the folks that will come will be those who profess Christianity. They grew up in homes like you're describing and in churches, something maybe even similar to ours. And uh, they're still struggling as Christians. Can Christians have a besetting sin? Is that even possible? So we need to wrestle with that theologically. Is it possible for Christians to get weighed down by sin? You know, the author of Hebrews, lay aside every weight which doth so easily beset you. He's talking to a Christian, a Christian audience. Lay aside those things that just keep you pinned down. Uh, I'll just close with a reading of the scripture. I think this answers, do we minister to the say, unsaved? Yes. Do we minister to the saved? Yes. And uh, 1 Corinthians 9 um, tells us here in verse, um, oh, verse 19, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. So our, our targeted audience is whoever God brings into our life, the all. 
And under the Jews, I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law is under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. So dealing with the Jews, Paul's going to, he is a Jew, and he's going to do certain things to reach Jewish people. He's going to adapt to that audience, not compromising truth, but to, to be wise in his presentation. And then he says, to them that are without law, those who are not Jews, Gentiles is without law, be not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. So with a Gentile, I'm going to reach the, them, you know, maybe a little differently than I would with a, with a Jew. So the Jew, I might use prophecies of Jesus in the Old Testament for the Gentile, I might start with creation story, whatever. And then he says here, and this is, this is where I think it really applies to what you were sharing, what we, I think we'll see. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men that I might by all, you know, re, you know biblical means, by all means save some. So who are the weak? Probably the weak believers in view there. So here are these unbelievers, unbelieving Jews, I'm going to try to win them. Unbelieving Gentiles, I'm going to try to win them. But I'm also going to try to win the weak. How is he going to win them? He's going to win them in sanctification, in Christian growth. They've already been saved. He's going to win them. And notice how he did that. The, the approach to the weak is I became I as weak. So Jim did something very subtle in his presentation where he demonstrated some weakness to connect with his audience. Did you catch it? So it's very imp important what he did there at the beginning. What, what did you hear him say about himself? Is that what you want to say? Yeah, so he, he said at the beginning of his presentation, when I got saved, I had three pages on a legal pad of people that I sinned against and I owed money. Did you catch that? I know Jim Berg for, you know, I've known him. Wow, I know him for 39 years. And I, I didn't know he ever sinned. His halo, from my viewpoint, is just perfectly arranged. He's never sinned. The lady that led me to the Lord, Mrs. Keener, I would tell people, I don't think she's ever sinned. She's the most perfect woman I've ever, ever met, okay? But he did something there very subtle. Jerry, go ahead. So how did that connect with you? Okay, because people are going to come here and say, well, you're the pastor, and you've never had a problem, and, and you've got it together, and you as a worker, you're just amazing. I can't be like you. When Slow Joe was living you know, in the house next to our church, he says, it's just, I can't get to where you are. It's too big a jump. I can't get there. So he's saying, I'm going to become as weak to win the weak. What is this? Seriously, what is this? That's funny, Jerry. <laughs> That's really cute. That's weakness. Seriously, that's weakness. Okay, what do I mean by that? That's weakness. Okay, believe me, that's weakness. It's by design. It's by design. What do I mean by that? Any, any stabs at that? It's pink. Pink, okay. People need to realize you're human. People need to realize that you've had your problems and you still struggle with it. And you still are a fallen creature and you got to be on guard. And so, so Paul's very, he's saying to the person who's struggling in sanctification, if I come across as this know-it-all, arrogant, superior than you, it's a shame you can't be like the Pharisee and me, you're not going to have any, you're not going to have ministry. But when you, when you show some humanity with a motive to try to win someone, to move them along the line, that's, that's good. That's that's godly. That's a good thing. And the ministry we're going to talk to, you know, I have a background of drunkenness, so I can connect pretty quickly with someone who's struggling. Hey, I've been there, done this, and I'm still guarded. I am very guarded um, with where I walk in stores. I don't want to concentrate on the beers I used to drink and the wines I used to drink and things I used to really, really like, and if I'm not careful, could fall right back into. 
you know, I'm out of town. You don't know what I'm doing out of town. What if I'm, what if I'm drinking out of town? Would that be a problem to you if I'm out getting drunk? But just a little bit, just my wife and I in a little you know, happy mountain party. No, I, I've got to be very, very guarded, still very, very guarded. And, and I'm not a drunk always. I'm not a drunk forever. That's, that's, that's a lie. Excellent question. Yes, Larry. Okay. My father still owned the business. My mother had left him. He asked me, what should I do? And I said, what means the most to you? And he said, your mother. He sold, I helped him sell everything, and they put their marriage back together. Amen. Sell everything was the bar, or the booze? Everything. The everything, whole, yeah. the bar, the whole, everything in the town. It's hard to help your kids grow when you own a bar. You know, we were in the Azores, and we won this kid to the Lord, or had a, a ministry of a guy. His name was Unaratu. Nice young teenager, growing on fire. His parents owned a bar. And uh, we were going to leave that island, and we said, you know what, this kid, he has, yeah, apart from the grace of God, he doesn't have a chance. You know, as we are leaving, the, 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 his pam, family gave us all kinds of whiskey and bottles from, the, from their bar. You know, they, they wanted to give us a gift. I said to our missionary, what do I do? I don't want to offend them. I'm not going to drink it. And, they, and he gave advice how to handle it, and that was helpful. But I, I just thought, how is this kid going to make it until mom and dad get some things right? Yeah, excellent. Larry, do you still have the mic in your hand? Would you get that to Larry? Have him close in prayer for us, please. Thank you for sharing that. Lord, we just come to you this evening. We just thank you for this new ministry. We know there are so many out there hurting. We need help. The only way is salvation and for those to repent. And for those, we just offer as a church our help. If they'll just come and enter our doors or someone in this group would touch somebody's life and say, how can I help you? We love you and reach out to them, not be judgmental. Lord, we just thank you now for this church, what it means to each of us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Larry. Thank you. It's been a good Lord's Day. You're dismissed. <laughs>